generally we pretty much talk about, all right, is it an int, or is it a float, or is it a string? If you have Microsoft's documentation, you see that there's all sorts of different data types. Can I uh, just zoom the text? Yeah. For example, this is not terribly useful, that it says that a short is larger or equal to the size of a car and shorter or equal or larger than a care, but shorter or equal to an int, yeah, whatever. But if you look, there are specific ones. Underscore, underscore, int a. If you really want an integer and you really only want it to be eight characters wide so that it can hold, you know, 256 different values, or int 16 so it can hold, you know, 65,003, whatever, or 32 or 64, you can specify that. Otherwise, you can go, okay, I'm going to use int for everything, and if I really want it to be long, then I'm going to choose long, long. I hate that name. That's the worst variable type ever. Long, long. Then there are floats, and there are doubles, and then there are long doubles. Now, since this is not telling us specifically the size of them, all right, here we go. Microsoft specific. One byte for bools, cares, and int eights. Two bytes, meaning 16-bit numbers, or int 16s and shorts. The four bytes are the floats and the ints, and also the longs, so you don't get any advantage by using a word long over an int in this language, in this implementation. And then the maximal values are doubles and long longs. So, let's just make a little note of that. I'm not going to ask you about the underscore core underscore versions, but if you ever need them, that one. Exists when you need to specify the, the bit width. Why might you want to? Because if you look at the specification for things like TCP IP headers. Then you'll see that certain things in it have specific links. A port number has to be two bytes long. A sequence number has to be four bytes long. TCP Transmission Control Protocol. TCP IP is the backbone of the internet. It's a protocol that all the machines use to talk to the routers, and the routers use to talk to each other. And you know, at one time, it was kind of an open question as to which header would rule, or, or which protocol would rule the TCP IP one. And so that's what a header for TCP looks like. And we can see that you know, in certain places, it specifies this would be really hard to accomplish because we don't have a data size that's only four bits long. But, you know, two bytes, that would be a 16-bit. So you could store the port number and the checksum and the whatever. So you may have times when you're reading data in from a file format that is very specific on how the data needs to be stored. Otherwise, just use int. If it needs to be bigger than an int, use long, long. The uh, approximate sizes for each one, largest int in Windows C++. You can get it to tell you by using some of the constants, or you can just kind of look them up. The largest int is 2 million. I believe that's million. Is that bi millions or billions? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, 2 billion is the largest int. If you're going to store a number that's a whole number that's larger than 2 billion, go for a long, long. So, ints plus or minus 2 billion. Larger than that, use long, long. Floats. I'm not seeing floats listed here. Integer constants. All right. Yeah, 
are probably listed in there as well. The largest flow, just 3.4 times 10 to the 38. If you need something larger than that, let's just say 3 times 10 to the 38. If you need something larger than that, use a double. Nothing wrong with using a double just all the time. In Java, you default to using um, doubles all the time pretty much. There's no reason to use a float. The language assumes that every floating point number you in enter is a double until proven otherwise. Okay, so we were talking about data types. We've seen several. We have seen ints. We know what those are. Floats. We know what those are. Which one uh, supports um, decimal points? Floats. Yep. So ints are whole numbers only. Then there's the character. The character type holds a value between 1 and 65536 or something like that, but we don't care about the numeric value. It actually holds, you know, something like an A or an exclamation mark. Know, or the number nine, or some symbol in you know, in uh, in Russian or Japanese, or whatever. Some character sets are only eight bits wide, meaning that you can only have one of two hundred fifty-six possible different characters in them. And then the larger character set is called Unicode, which is sixteen bits wide. And the reason for that is is because there's a lot more letters on the planet Earth than just two hundred fifty-six. Okay, and then we have strings, which are collections of characters. Not really digging the word collection, but you get the idea. And another type, bool, which stands for true or false. So you can do things like this. Bool is big, is big, is equal to, is my number x greater than, you know, something like that. Then you could do if is big. Do print out. Wow, that's a big number. Like that. So when you do this kind of operation where you calculate a value like that, a true false value, that's typically called a flag. it gets set true under certain conditions and it might tell your program to stop processing at that point or whatever. A cool data type. Zeros are false, ones are trues. So if you cast it to a numeric data type and it was true, then it'll print out a one. Early versions of C did not have a bool data type. People would use ints and just did pound sign def false equals to zero and true is equal to one. Determining the size of a data type. If you don't know how many bytes are in an int and you care, you can find out with the size of operator, not operator, function. And this is actually a little bit more important than that sounds because you use it in other cases other than just figuring out, okay, a long has the same size as an int. We may as well go ahead and pop open Visual Studio to maintain our state of awareness. We need to ask that uh, these get upgraded to like 2017 or something before fall. These are like four years old now. That's old. Okay, so I'm going to make a new project just so I have kind of a scratch pad to type stuff into. And I'm going to get my boilerplate ready for such an occasion. Or not. It's not finding it. I can type it faster than that. It's a good idea to be able to type it by hand, so we'll do so if you don't have it at your beck and call. Add new item, C++ file, I don't care about the name of it, so it's going to stay source.cpp. Pound side include angle brace IO stream. 
pound sign include string using namespace std int main in parentheses in parentheses at the end of it I'm going to put a system parentheses quote pause end quote in parentheses semicolon all right there's my boilerplate so int x is equal to 3 let's find out what the size of that is c out size of an int Let's do a long. Long y is equal to 3. And do this. Oh. Tell you what. We don't even need these things. Just make. I, don't, I typed it right there. I didn't use the variable name. You could put x there. You know. But we're just saying. What is the size of an int? And then I'm going to copy and paste that. So I can make that a long. And then I can make it a long long. And it says that an int is four bytes, a long is four bytes, and a long long is eight bytes. At other points, this becomes important to know if you need to calculate the length of a structure. A structure is something that contains multiple pieces of data in it. Kind of like that internet packet header that I was showing you, you know. That could be done as a structure, and it had a whole bunch of different pieces of data in it. You could define a structure that had a whole bunch of different variables in it, variables and, you know, longs and ints and cares and whatever. And then if you're going to write that out to a file, you may want to know how many bytes long it is. And you could use size of, you know, your structure to get the length of it. Where we have our... Uh, Data types here, we could have passed in a variable as well. If I had done, as I had originally, int x is equal to zero, if I put x here, it would still tell me the size of an int. It's just telling me the size of that very specific int, which is the same as size as every other int. Another place where size of gets used is in arrays. If you're a Python programmer or a Java programmer, you're going to find arrays in C++ very primitive. For example, there's no... Uh, method that will calculate the length of the array for you. You know, no size of or len parentheses or dot length or anything like that. Yeah. However, you can get the size of the array sometimes by doing this. If, say I had an array called A. This isn't actually going to work because I haven't defined an array. But, oh heck, let's, no, not going not gonna to get too far off. But if you did the size of the array divided by the size of the first element of the array that would give you the length of the the length of the array it would give you the size of the array how many elements were in the array now is that crude as heck yeah that's crude as heck does that work everywhere in C++ no it doesn't so like I said arrays in C++ are kind of jacked compared to uh, to more recent implementations however there are other data structures you can use in C++ that, uh, you know, do away with the uh, weakness of arrays. But arrays are incredibly common. They are the fastest way to process data. And they're pretty sure, pretty, oh, anyways, let's go on. Yeah. So an assignment statement uses equal sign. A single equal is called an assignment operator. Item is equal to 12. That copies the number 12 into a variable called item which you better have already declared in this language. You have to declare every variable before you can use them. And you have to initialize them with a value before you can use an if on it or while. So it goes from left to right. You can't do 12 is equal to item. That's trying to copy the value of this variable into a constant. That doesn't work. You have to say item is equal to 12, not 12 is equal to item. I said left to right. That was wrong. It goes right to left. I'm dyslexic, sorry. There we go. You could initialize your variables 
which means assign it a value while you're defining it. Here I'm defining my variable and I'm assigning it a value at the same time. Yeah, and as long as they're all the same type, you can do multiples. Length is equal to 12, width is equal to 5. Here they tacked on a third variable and they didn't in initialize it, they didn't assign it a value. But they did these two. Right, because they're going to calculate it, exactly. C++ introduces an, or oh, the 2011 version of it, introduces an alternate way to define variables using the auto keyword. I never you do this. But if you say auto amount is equal to 100, the compiler goes, oh, well, 100's an int, I better make that an int. And if you do auto interest rate is equal to 12.0, it goes, well, that's a double. Okay, I'll make that a double. That's a character, I'll make that a care. That's a long, I'll make that a long. I can't give you a compelling reason as to why you would use that, but I'm not going to even put it in the notes or ask you any questions about it. But you can if you ever see that word. Scope. People who've taken Programming 1113 are already familiar with the idea of scope. Scope is a region in your program where a variable can be accessed. And I'll show you what I mean. If I do this, if x is equal to 0, which hopefully it is because I called it 0 up above, and so I define a new variable, y, that variable is, his scope is limited to the braces in which he is defined. I can't access this variable outside of it. I can't go down here and do C out Y, like that. This variable doesn't exist outside of the brace. You may not be able to see it, but it's underlined there. It says identifier Y is undefined. Uh, so like, I know in Python, when if you use a variable outside of a loop or in a statement, you could like use global. Can you use global to, if you like define Um, this language doesn't have the global keyword. If you want a global variable, you just come up here and you pick it. So int, you know, height is equal to 3, like that. This variable, since it's defined above the first brace in the code, is available to every function, every line of code that follows. So this is a, what's known as a global variable. Global variables are kind of frowned upon. Later on, we'll figure out other ways that we might do it. If you are going to use global variables, it's better to stick them in a namespace. The way you do that is you do namespace and then you pick a name for it. It could even be the, uh, you know, the name of the C file that you're in, Jeff's stuff, you know, like that. And then any code that needs to could get a hold of that variable by pref prefixing it with Jeff's stuff, like Jeff's stuff dot height is equal to 4. And you could do that inside any, uh, call I'm getting an error. A namespace name is not allowed. Oh, it's colon colon, excuse me. Like that. So a global variable is one that's defined outside of the functions. You can put them in a namespace to make them tidy. When you use them, you prefix the variable names of the namespace, or you do this using namespace std. If I didn't want to have to prefix everything with a height, excuse me, with Jeff stuff that was defined up here, I could do using namespace Jeff stuff. Then I could get away without specifying the namespace for it. So you can use multiple namespaces at once. Correct. Okay. Right, right. I could define multiple namespaces if I had some reason to do that. I don't know why, but I could, yeah. Like that, whatever. If a variable is created inside of a function like this, it's called a local variable. Height is not a local variable because it was defined outside of any of the functions. X is a local variable. It's defined inside the function. Local variables, their scope is limited to the curly braces in which they are defined. 
global variables can be accessed by any, by any code. You could even have global variables get changed by code in other CPP files as long as they know how to access it, as long as they know the namespace for it, and those files are linked together. So a variable cannot be used before it is defined. So if I had, come back here, up here above this int x is equal to 0, if I did if x is equal to 1, that's an error because x has not been defined yet. A common thing to, for people to do, which is not strictly necessary, but is to define all of the variables at the top of the code, you know, whatever. It puts them all in a tidy little place where you know to go and look for them. But you don't have to do that. You could sprinkle them all throughout it. It can make it a little bit harder to read. So key is not accessible here because the y variable is out of scope. You can't see it anymore. It was defined as a local variable within the scope of the two braces, meaning you can't get to it outside of it. You can have more than one function in a file. Right here, we have a function called main. I'm going to write another function called something else. If you define variables in this one, they're not accessible inside a main, or vice versa. If I try to do if x is equal to 4, do something. X was defined inside these braces. So it's not accessible anywhere else. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. So the scope of a variable is the region in which it is accessible or in which it exists. Local variables are defined within functions. Example, int main, int x. x is a local variable. It can be accessed anywhere within main. Right, you'll get an error if you have two CPP files, both of them with a the main. Yeah, because I tried the. Because if you're trying to do your homework and you're creating. I, I created a homework to yep. project and put both of them in the. I was like, oh. Right, right. It, your file names have to be unique. Not your file names, your function names have to be unique. If you're creating classes, you can create multiple classes that have the same function names in them. That's just what we call our function. Okay, so, the, so you can name it anything. Right. Still, oh, okay. Is it even reserved in Java? It's not a reserved word. You have to start your, there has to be at least, there has to be one main function in your class or else it doesn't know what to launch. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just retyping this example here. If x is equal to 1, we create a new variable and then that variable is not going to be accessible anywhere else. I have created a problem in this code besides the fact that I'm trying to use a variable that doesn't exist. If this code compiled, it would not run correctly. I kind of doubt it would compile. What's wrong with this code? Right. X is not defined. Well, it's defined, but it's declared, but it does not have a value. It is not initialized or, or a value. No value is set to it. So that would fix that. Okay. Error because y is out of scope. Not defined. You can uh, confuse yourself if you do something like this. You give multiple definitions to the same variable. Name. Suppose I do this. If x is equal to 0, which it is, then int x is equal to 3. C out x equals 
x, e and dl. And then here, I do another one, c out x is equal to e and dl. This is the first time we see that. This is the second time we're going to see it print out. I wonder what it's going to print. It ought to print 3, right? There, because we just set it to 3. Why is the second one set to 0, though? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, this is a completely different variable than this one. Right, I could put it in a separate function, or if this was, you know, it's totally cool to do this. You know, I already had y defined up here. I could go ahead and define another y here. That's fine, because this y no longer exists once you fall out of that if statement. So, cool, go ahead and define it. This is called masking, or hiding. This x hid the other x. So when we assigned it to 3, We don't know what the original value of x is anymore until we get out of that block of code. And maybe you can probably make like, I don't know, a game that tells you what an integer is before you go into the loop and then it just jumbles it up in and you have to remember what the last one is. <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah. something to the screen, but then take it off, like, take it off the screen. Uh, you can backspace over it if you're using a character-oriented display. I don't know if I would do that. So this first one is going to print what? I mean, we just saw it print out, but anyways, yeah. it's going to print three, and as long as we have a variable up here, a value defined up here, x is equal to 1, then, or 0, then the next time we go through, it's going to print out. What do I have that 2 there for? That's a 3. It's going to print out a 0 again. Arithmetic operators. C++ has unary, meaning they have one operand, binary, and ternary operators. Binary, in this case, not meaning made of zeros and ones, although everything is in the computer. It means that they have two parts. The operator is the math symbol. The operands are the values on either side of the symbol. If it's a unary operator, it's only got one number next to it. I, I can really only think of one unary operator, which is the minus sign. What do you use that for? Like if you're going to say A is equal to negative 1,000. That negative modifies the value 1,000. A binary one consists of two operands, and that's all of our basic math. You know, binary operands plus minus multiplication division. So if you see out you know, 13 plus 20. What's the operand? The operand is the plus. Oper no. Operator <laughs> is go. the plus. Operands are 13 and 20. And then there's one called the ternary operator. It's actually got three components rather than two, and the syntax of it is so weird that, well, I guess we'll wait until we hit the slide. Okay, so this is pretty basic. Addition, 7 plus 3, 10. Subtraction, 7 minus 3, 4. Multiplication, 21. Division, oh, and there's our good friend, the modulus. If uh, you've taken a programming course before, you've probably gotten annoyed at modulus. Modulus means you do the division and then you get the remainder. So, for example, if you have 10 divided by 3 and they are both integers, which in, this, in which case they are, 
that's equal to 3. Because they're both integers, the result has to be an integer, meaning you can't have a fractional component. So it's going to do the division. It's going to round down. Integer division rounds down. Modulus, the percent sign. I guess I didn't list my operators. OK. Operators, minus, minus, multiplication, division, and then modulus. spelled it. Division modulus. Modulus means remainder. So 10 modulus 3 is 1 because the 3 went into 10 three times with a remainder of 1. So 10 divided by 2 is what? 5. So 10 modulus 2, well what was the remainder after we divided by 2? 0. Zero. Right. If you want to break something up into dollars and cents, int pennies is equal to 987. Int dollars is equal to 987 divided by 100, because there's 100 pennies per dollar. And int cents is equal to 987 modulus 100. So when we were done with this, Dollars would equal what? 987 divided by 100 is what? So it's equal, no, it doesn't round down. So it's just 9. Dollars is equal to 9, and then cents is equal to what? I know y'all know. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. You can use that to check to see if a number is equal or not. The modulus always rounds up, right? Um, well, I mean, sorry. it applies to integers, so the answer is going to be an integer. Some languages let you modulus a, uh, a float. Let's find out if this one does. So double d is equal to 31.3, double, I don't know. R for remainder is equal to D modulus 3.2. Yeah, it's already starting to complain. It, expression must have an integral or unscoped enum type. Not that we've typed, talked about enums. But anyways, okay. So in this language, you can only apply modulus for ints. Python lets you do modulus of floats, I believe. So a closer look at the division operator. If both sides of it are integers, the result is an integer. However, if either one of them is a float, because it's got a decimal point, or that's how you declare the variable, then it does floating point math. So if you did uh, 13 divided by 5, that's a 2. But if you do 13 divided by 5.0, then you get really whatever that is, 2 point whatever, 6? Yeah, 2.6. Oh, well, what do you know? It's right there, huh? Okay. So, if both operands of division are ints, the result is an int. If one or both operand of division is a float, the result is a float. So, 5 divided by 2, what's that equal to? Neither one is a float, so it's a whole number, so it's going to be 2. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I was confused. I didn't know if they rounded up or just. Right, but they're both integers, so it's not going to round. Okay. Yeah. And then 5 divided by 2.0 equals 2.5. Right. But 
what it is. <laughs> <laughs> if you're doing integer math. So modulus computes the remainder div resulting from integer division. Comments. Comments are those things that are prefixed by slash slash, or if you want a multi-line comment, you use slash star and then star slash. So this is a single line comment. If you want multiples of those, you got to keep doing that. And here is another and a third. Okay, or you can do this. This is a multi-line comment. It just keeps going and going. Professional programmers document their code, like the guy who programmed Doom and then Quake, John Carmack, licensed the Quake graphics engine to a whole bunch of other gaming companies so that they wouldn't have to write their own 3D library. He made millions upon millions of dollars doing that, but in order to keep in the game, he had to continually keep it, you know, new and improved. And if you have something that's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lines of code long you're not going to remember what all it does and more importantly if you hire other people to start working on it with you when the project becomes too large they're not going to have a clue as to what it does if uh, there are no comments in it named constants a named constant is a variable that is preceded with the c-o-n-s-t keyword and there's no such thing i believe in python i don't recall there being one there is in java but it's got a goofy word final I wish uh, they hadn't gotten all uppity and they just called it const like uh, C++ did. So anyways, you have const, you have the data type, you have the variable name, and that is a guarantee, the compiler guarantees that the value of tax rate will not be changed later on in the code, meaning that if you try to change the value of tax rate later, you're going to get an error in the code. It will not compile. It's not an error, it's just a compilation. So if we do this, int tax underscore rate is equal to 13.5%. We pay a lot of taxes here. But then later on in my code, if I do if x is equal to 0, then I feel like changing the tax rate for some reason. Tax rate is equal to 14. Yeah, I can do that. Howsoever, maybe when I was designing the program, I wanted the tax rate to be the same all the way through the code and I didn't want anybody to be able to change it except in one place, which is where it was initialized. In that case, you add the word const to it. Const tells you, oh, nope, you can't change its value. It underlines that as being an error. The expression must be a modifiable L value. Well, that L value is kind of cryptic. It's just the value on the left-hand side of the expression. So this is not a modifiable value because it is a const. So just like we could not do this, just like we could not do 12 is equal to x, because 12 is a constant, it's an unnamed constant known as a literal. A named constant is one that has a name and that has been initialized to a value. Why do you use those? Just so that you kind of have a contract with yourself. I only define this tax rate once in my program. So that if Another programmer steps in and he thinks that he can store any data he wants to in it. He's wrong, and he'll figure that out as soon as he tries to. So if you, like, say if you uh, or declared the tax rate before you name the constant, will it override that one? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, gosh, good question. <laughs> Const, let's make this one not a constant. And we've already seen that we can redeclare variables. What would happen if we try to make that one constant? Mm -hmm. That works. What happens if you make this one constant and this one not? Yeah. Also works. But pretty much. Doing that defines a variable. And when you name them, you're supposed to name them in all uppercase. That's just convention, followed by programmers in many, many languages. You know, Java, C++, they all kind of follow the same convention. So 
constants and variables in general? Yeah, constants are variables that are just are flagged as being immutable, unchangeable. The only way you can change them is to change where they are initialized. Yeah, you can create a new <laughs> variable with a different name just to mess somebody up. <laughs> Our goal is not to mess people up. Okay. Right, right. Error because tax rate is a const. Chapter 2. Here's an example. Pi may as well be defined as a constant because you shouldn't be changing it. You shouldn't later on decide that pi really equals 4.2. The diameter, I kind of differ making a diameter constant because your program may, may need to, you know, change the diameter at a certain point. But that's an example. And so your equations then become circumference is equal to pi in caps times, you know, whatever the other thing is, or pi, you know, pi r squared or whatever your formula is going to be. Their value of pi is defined in a math library. You don't have to define it like that each time. I don't care if you want to do it that way. Programming style. Big letters. Why don't we shrink that down? That's the visual organization of the source code. How you use your spaces, how you use your tabs, how you use your blank lines does not affect the syntax of the program. It does affect the readability of the source code. One little quirk you'll see is that uh, Java seems to really like doing the braces like that. That makes absolutely no difference to the code, but to me it makes it harder to read. Um, and when I say Java seems to like that, the editors that you install. Um, NetBeans and Eclipse and stuff like that default to that behavior. That's called the Kernigan and Ritchie style of brace placement because the inventors of the C programming language, their documentation, all assume that. This is called block style. You pick which, whichever one you like or you pick whichever one has already been in use. If you go nuts and you have 10,000 lines of code and then you change all the, all the braces just because you know they offended you where they were, then your other programmers are going to kind of get annoyed. So you do want to try to make your programs as readable as possible, meaning that you do want to do good tab placement. And that gets annoying because sometimes when you're cutting and pasting, you know, your code winds up, you know, looking like this, you know, and whatever. Go ahead and take the time to make it look good. I'm not going to count you off if you don't line everything up. But I promise you, the code is far easier for you to understand if visually all the, uh, all the code is lined up appropriately by tabs. It's easier Yeah. So, what else to mention? White space helps. You can write your code kind of in paragraphs. If you have you know, a concept here, this is supposed to be kind of one conceptual unit of stuff, it's okay to put a blank line before you go to something else. You'll see me kind of do that. On the other hand, when I'm trying to get as much code onto a single screen as possible for y'all, you'll see me remove the white space. You're just trying to make stuff easy to read. The easier it is to read, the easier it is for you to come back two years later when you need to modify it or when somebody else has to understand it. All right, that's the end of Chapter 2. So out here in... Um, why does this look weird? Okay. Anyways. Out in D2L where I had pasted, nope, wrong, wrong class. Not where I pasted, where I posted, please read chapter one. There's another note that says, read chapter two, pretty please. That's where we are. Let's go on to chapter three. Okay. 
if it seems like I've gone through something too fast, it's probably because this class assumes that you've had 1113 or another beginning introduction to computers class. And if you have not, then you either are going, yeah, I understand that, or you're going, what the? If you're going, what the? Let me know. And we can go back and we can talk about it because my goal is not to go too fast. But I also I'm have to. Slowly, I'm just a slow reader and a slow learner. So. That, that's cool, but, you, but you're picking it up. I can tell from your comments in the class. So, like I said, if I go too fast, Tell me. Yeah. Okay, well then, you could probably teach the class. So the CIN object, that's the standard input object. We already talked about C out in the other, uh, other PowerPoint. It requires the include IO stream. You use it to read from keyboard. There are other kinds of streams other than just console in and console out. You can write to a file using the same arrow arrow operators, which is kind of nifty. C++ supports that, whereas Java does not. In Java, if you want to change your program from writing to the screen to writing to a file, you can follow a very similar syntax, but you do have to make changes to it. C++, you just declare a different output stream and then you're pretty much good to go. We'll, we'll understand a lot more about that later. And we've already seen it, so I'm not going to focus on that slide. You know, CIN arrow arrow width lets the user type in a value and stores it in width. And it's best if the user types in something that you're expecting. What do I mean by that? If uh, you think that width is going to have a fractional point, if the user is going to want to type in point zero or something like that, you better not declare it as an int. This program would probably be very poorly behaved if they typed in a length and a width with fractional components. Let's find out. I'm not going to type the whole thing in, but let's ask the user for two values, A and B, and then try to multiply them. So C out, enter A. We need to declare our variables, int A and B. got my quote, that's why I'm getting an error there. So C I N into A, I'll do the same thing. C out, enter B. C A N into B. And let's C out A, and then a multiply sign, and then a B, and then an equal sign, and then A times B. What if that'll work? First, let's test it with good data. I'm going to type in two integers. A is 10. B is 20. 10 times 20 is equal to 2,004. What? Oh. If you look at my code, maybe you can see what I did wrong. Why did it print out 2,004? What is 10 times 20? It's 200. But later on, I have this print statement here <laughs> that printed out 4. So what I should have done is I should have printed out an ENDL just to end that. Okay, great. Like hitting character turn, like hitting enter at the end of a, you know, type, 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 type. Okay, so that did actually work. 10, 20 is equal to 200. Now what if I don't know that I'm supposed to limit it to integer input and I type in 10.0? And it goes nuts. We kind of saw this one last time. It wasn't expecting a decimal point. It just really messed it up. Um, so, pardon me? I'm sorry. Um, on the code, I'm kind of confused where, like, you have enter A and then you have CN, but you don't end the line. So why is the enter B on the next line? Because in order to type in 10.0, I had to hit the enter key. And that forced okay. it. If I did put ENDL after the inner A, then it just would put the 10.0 on the line by itself. Okay. Because I tried, I tried to do it and it gave me a, I tried to put like in line after C and A. And it, yeah, you can't do that. You can't mix them both in the same line. Okay. But I could do that, and I could do that, which would mean that when I said inner A, then where they typed in would be underneath it. Okay. 
just depends on whether you like it there or there. CIN converts data to the type that matches the variable. That's a bit optimistic, as we've seen that that conversion can go horribly wrong. But if you declare type as a float, then whatever they type will be stored as a float, even if they only type an integer. Don't try to do the conversion. When you're dealing with numbers, you could just always use floats or doubles under the assumption that the user may want to enter decimal points. Yeah. Only a few nerdy people would probably say I am 38.5 years old, but you never know. <laughs> so displaying a prompt, the act of prompting somebody is to tell somebody to display a question and then let them type in something. How tall is the room? Enter height. That's just called prompting the user, and there's more than one kind of prompt. You could pop up a little window, you know, it says enter password and you make them type in a password. That's a password prompt. All right. We'll go through a little bit more before we do it in class. So CIN can be used to import more than one thing at the same time. You could do this. Let's go back to our little bit of code. Enter A and B, then hit enter. OK. I don't like using the word enter twice. So type A and B, and then hit enter. And then we could do this, CIN. Arrow, arrow, A, arrow, arrow, B. But I wouldn't store what's in A and B. I wouldn't do that. Well, if they type in 10 space 20, then 10 is going to go into A, and 20 is going to go into B. This looks like it would copy the contents of A yeah, and stick them into B, but it doesn't. Okay. So however many things they type will fill in these variables. And then one more thing to show, type C and hit enter, ENDL, and then CIN into C, which we don't have declared, so I'm going to come up here and declare it. There, now we have th three variables. So when I run it, it says type A and B, then hit enter. Okay, 10 and 20. You have to separate them by spaces. Type C and hit enter, 30. Okay, and it does something. 10 times 20 is 200. Who knows what it did with 30, but that worked. But, suppose you do this. 10, 20, 30. It says type C and hit enter, but since that 30 was already sitting there waiting to be read, it went ahead and read it. It read in both A, which was 10, and B, which is 20, and 30 was, quote, in the buffer. It was in the stream waiting. So we didn't have to type anything in. It was already there. Does that work for a lot of these, like, command line interfaces? It does. You specifically have to clear the input buffer if you don't want that to happen. And there's a command to do that. There's a command to say, okay, by the way, I don't care what's sitting there in the input buffer. I want you to start fresh. And if we did that, then even though we typed in 10, 20, 30 there, they would be required to type in a value for C as well. It's a very good so question. Would just kick out that 30, you wouldn't do anything. Right, that. it would be ignored. It'd be completely ignored. That's cool. C plus the only language that does that, or I mean, well, I mean. No, um, a lot of languages do that kind of buffering. I don't recall if Python does. I know that Java does. So the import, the order is important. The first value entered goes into the first variable. Since we had C, N, A, and then B, whatever the user typed in first goes into A, whatever the user types in second goes into B. Okay, set into our notes. And you know how we have like the, uh, how you like split strings and stuff in Python? What if you like type 
type in 10, comma 20. Well, never mind, these are ends, so they're not too tight. Yeah, it would not be well behaved in that case. Concatenate them. We'll try it out. We'll find out. So, there's something called concatenation, which is when you take two strings and build a larger string out of them. Does C++ support concatenation? Let's find out. String, FN for first name. Let's see, go to Bob. String, last name. Go to Marley. String full is equal to a first name plus a quote, space end quote, plus a last name. It worked, no syntax errors, and so let's just print out the full name. Okay, so yeah, you can concatenate things like that. And when you're printing stuff out with arrow, arrow, it uh, effectively is concatenating them as well. Like when I said x is equal to, and then I printed out the number, then that output is all concatenated together. You know, x equals followed by the number. Okay, one more thing to notice about this business of using the buffer in order to read in more than one number at the same time. If I run this, Type A and B and then hit enter, but they only type in A. It just sits there. Then they get frustrated and they start hitting enter. They don't know what's going on. They hit, you know, eh, some of those. And then we're really up a creek. It stops working. So requiring them to type in two pieces of data on a line is maybe not the most wise thing. Another example of that would be if you said type in first name space last name. They may be dumb and just type in a first name and hit enter and then wonder why the program's not doing anything else. You might want to let them type in a first name in one field and then a last name, you know, with a second CN statement. Mathematical expressions. An expression is a series of symbols, which are either these, you know, these literals or these variables separated by operators. 2 times pi times radius is an expression. 2 times length plus width is an expression. An expression can be a literal, a variable, or any combination of the above separated by operators. Typically, you think of an expression as being something like that. If you did area is equal to 2 and you just stopped it like that, then, okay, what's the expression? Well, the expression is 2, but that's pretty boring because it's just a value, you know. 2 times pi times radius is what people traditionally think of as being an expression. x plus y, 3 divided by 10. All of those are expressions, but technically, even a single piece of data is an expression unto itself. Oh yeah, did we skip the ternary completely? Yeah, there never was unless I skipped it. Well. Okay, so the unary operator is negative, as in x is equal to negative 1,000. The binary operators are all the math, plus, minus, times, division, percent. x is equal to 3 times 4. Here's what the ternary one looks like. Say I do this. x is equal to 100. y is equal to x greater than 0, question mark, 1, colon, negative 1. All right, that's pretty wild, isn't it? Putting the uh, parentheses here made it a little bit easier to read, but they're not re necessarily part of the syntax. The way you read this is everything before the question mark gets evaluated. Is that a Boolean statement then? It, it's a Boolean. It's sort of a Boolean. It's not going to give you a true or false, 
but this gets evaluated, and if that's true, then 1 gets copied into y. Else negative, one. Else negative 1 gets copied oh. into y. So that's the same thing as writing, yeah, if x is greater than 0, y is equal to 1, else y is equal to negative 1. Yeah, the same thing exists in Java. The C++ one is really weird because you can actually put code in these things. This is terrible, but you could do this. X greater than zero, question mark, C out, yes, colon, C out, no. That might not actually compile, but that gives you the idea. You can embed little blocks of code there. Don't do that. That's nasty. However, doing that is accepted programming practice. You'll, you'll see that all over the place. Just because typing one line is seductive as compared to typing four lines. But it's harder to read. To make it slightly easier to read, I go ahead and I put those in. You know, to me that's easier to read. Um, when you have like your C out and C in, when do you have to close the string? Like I know sometimes I see you do like C out and then you do the two greater than signs and you type in your string and then you just like you end it with the semicolon. And then sometimes you continue with the Right. If I wanted these to work correctly, I would probably do slash ends there. So the question is, when do you need to terminate your string with an end of line and when not? And the answer is just whenever you want it to go to the next line. If they're going to type in something, then you don't necessarily need to slash in because they're going to hit enter. But if they're not going to type in anything, then yeah, you absolutely want the slash in or the ENDL. We're clear that ENDL and slash in are the same thing. I'm lazy, and if I'm doing this, C out, hello, rather than do this, which is more typing, I would just do like that. I guess it's just because a few more characters. I'm, I'm not used to using that backslash. Right. So when I'm typing, I think I can type that whole thing faster than just <laughs> searching for the backslash. Right. It's right above it. Or... Yeah. So order of operations. Order of operations is important. Multiplications have higher precedence than addition. So if you were going to do this and you're going to figure it out in your head, you don't do it like a calculator does. And what I mean by that, you don't type in 5 plus 2, enter, and get 7, and then type times 4 and hit enter, and 7 times 4 is 28. Instead, it gets evaluated to where multiplications happen before addition. Divisions happen before subtraction. So, this gets done first. 2 times 4 is 8, and then we add 5 to it. That's why it says 13. Divisions happen before subtraction, so 10 divided by 2 is 5, minus 3 is 2. Now, even if you were doing left to right purely, you would come up with that answer, but this one, doing left to right, would get you the wrong answer because it absolutely is not 7 times 4. It's 5 plus 8. And you can always use parentheses to hammer in the point. If I want the code to be easy to read, I might do 5 plus parentheses, 2 times 4, even though the parentheses weren't necessary, just because visually it's a good cue to remind you. So the order of precedence. What's that mnemonic? Yeah, PM DAS. Yeah. Yep. Parentheses. Multiplication division. And addition. And subtraction. Yeah, there is an exponent, but there's no exponent character in uh, Python, so I left it out. In uh, in C plus plus. There is in Python. Asterisk, asterisk means to the power of. So you can't, so you can't use. I think I just lied to you. No, it's the E. e. There, there is an E symbol for raising things to an exponent, but there's no caret or double star. Let's prove that to ourselves. Double X, no, double DDD is equal to. 3 
to the power of 12. Is that going to work? All right, let's see if that works, because that certainly didn't. Well, lo and behold. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, that always helps me whenever I do a program. If I get doing that, it means that it's an exponent. Okay. All right. Just be warned that some languages don't support that at all. Java does not, and Python uses a different operator. Shift 6 will give you a syntax error, and you have to use a double multiply. What is this? Oh, never mind. So, yeah. So, I got to put the E inside of PIMDAS. Yep, it's C plus plus. plus plus. Yeah, it's C improved. Okay, so P E M. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Parentheses exponent, and we should have been listing exponent as one of our binary operators then up here. So if there's more than one operator on the same line, you just do it left to right. So if you do this, C out, 3 plus 4 minus 2 plus 6, you don't have to worry about the order. They're all the same precedence, so you just go left to right. 3 plus 4 is 7, minus 2 is 5, plus 6 is 11. It's when you're mixing layers of precedence that you have to worry. So operators of the same precedence level, evaluate did left to right. Otherwise, do them in precedence order, P before E before MD before addition and subtraction. So let's come up with a few of those. What would 3 times what? Yeah. 3 times 2 plus 1, 3 plus 2 times 1, that's kind of stupid, but whatever. 3 times parentheses, you can force things to happen in a different order by using the parentheses. So, what gets evaluated first here? Multiply or addition? Multiplication. Right, so that's 6 plus 1 that's is 7. Right. Again, multiplication gets done first, but whatever, 2 times 1 is 1. 3 plus 2 uh, is 5, yeah. Even if you had done that one left to right, it would have given me the same answer. So I should not have made it 3, 2, 1. I should have made it like 3, 2, 2. Now 3 times 2 plus 1, this gets done first because the parentheses change the order of precedence. PIMDAS, parentheses get done first. So that forces this to be done first. 3 times 3 is 9. All right, hide this. Hide the answers. All righty. What's this one? Eyeballing it. 13. That's 13. Yeah, but you remembered that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and what's this one? 10 divided by 2 is 5, minus 3 is 2. Here, multiplication happens first, right? So 12 times 2 is 24. Minus 4 is 20 plus 8. 28. Right. Here's a modulus. The modulus is... I meant to... Uh, there was a topic on modulus that I skipped over after saying I was going to talk about it. But... Okay, so 17 divided by 2 would be 8, but 17 modulus 2, what is it? It's 1, because modul um, 17 is an odd number. Any number modulus 2, if it's odd, is 1. Any number modulus 2, if it's even, is evenly divisible, so it's 0. So that's 1. 4 plus, and modulus counts as the MD here. So multiplication, division, and modulus. So please excuse my maniacal, dear Aunt Sally. I don't know. Anyways, just remember that modulus is the same level as multiplication and division. So 6 minus 3 times 2 plus 7 minus 1. What are we going to do first? So 3 times 2 is 6. 6 minus 6 is 
0 plus 7 and minus 1 is 6. Okay, I'm going to come up with some, and I want you all to do them together, just so, or, you know, separately, so that we have something that we're going to put in the drop box, along with what's coming up next. Do you want a text file, or do you want a... Yeah, text file or Word file, or C file, I don't care what you want to do. Now that we know that the exponent works, thank you very much. We may as well use one of them. All right, so create a word, a, a notepad file, type in those five equations, and then in your head, calculate the answer. The only reason I'm having you do this exercise is it's sure to show up on an exam, so you may as well get a moment of practice. Now, when you get to an exam, since these are open book, open computer exams, you could conceivably type all of that stuff into your C editor and compile it to get the answer. However, that wastes a lot of time. Far better just to be able to eyeball it. these first ones. I guess that'll make it a real quiz. Okay, so if you want to decide if a number is even or not, if x modulus 2 is equal to 0, that means it's even. Else, c out, i. C++ doesn't have like the true false keywords, right? It does, lowercase though, rather than uppercase. Okay. Right, so the Boolean values, if you did this, Boolean even is equal to x percent 2, then by the time that was done, if even equal true, or if even equal false. Howsoever, you don't have to say if even equal equal true. You can just say if even. And you don't have to do if even equal equal false. You could do this if not even. Not that we've talked about the exclamation mark yet, but these are written the same way. This means that, and this means More simple expressions and testing. I think we've already belabored that point. Expressions, algebraic expressions. People write algebra in such a way that you can't code it as is. And what I mean by that is uh, people will give you, you know, a book may say that area is equal to 2 pi r. You know, they may do the benefit of spacing it out, you know. You can't enter that into a program. Why? Code wants to see asterisks between everything. So things like A is equal to 2R, that's an error. How do you fix it? A is equal to 2 divided by R. Semicolon, yeah. 
So books and people writing stuff by hand will leave out will sometimes leave out the star or the X. Yeah. Our code can't. Another thing is, is if you do this, x is equal to 3 plus a over 4 plus b. If we were going to code that, we might be tempted to do it like this. x is equal to 3 plus a divided by 4 plus b. What's wrong with that? Yep. Yep. Because this would get done first. Are there higher math repositories? Or like if you wanted to do trig functions and stuff like that? Yeah, th there's a math library where you can do trig and sign, you know, and that kind of stuff. Okay. So what we have to do to fix that is at the very least put the bottom in parentheses. I would just put them both in parentheses for clarity. So algebraic expressions, if you're given something like this, you have to code it like that. And you could leave off the first parentheses. Is that a true statement? No, I said you could leave off the first one, and then that's completely wrong. You can't. I don't even know why I said that, because otherwise it would do y2. It would do all of that first and then subtract it from y2. POW is an alternate to using the, uh, the caret, the shift 6, to raise something to the power of something else. Offhand, I don't know the advantage of using one over the other. If you do area is equal to POW S comma 2, or you do area is equal to S caret 2, I would expect them to give me the same answer. We could test it out or we could just accept it on faith. Let's go find out. So DDD was equal to 3 times 12, double D2 is equal to POW, 3 to the power of 12. Let's print them both out. C out DDDD, followed by a space, followed by D2, followed by ENDL. Just see if they look the same. Well, what? It says that 3 to the power of 12 is 15. Maybe the caret doesn't. I'm thinking the caret doesn't do. What does the caret do? Let's find out. Ah, operator C++. Okay, fine. Maybe if I put that in quotes, it'll force it to find that. Okay. It's a bitwise operator. It doesn't mean to the power of. Everything we've said about using shift six to use to mean to the power of, forget. I believe it means exclusive or. We don't know what bitwise operators are yet, or maybe you do, but we haven't talked about them. We're going to leave that behind for now. Okay, we need to revise our notes. In fact, I'm just going to put that up at the quote at the very top. Shift six does not mean to the power of. Instead, use POW function. Two to the POW, or X is equal to POW, two to the power of three. I'm disappointed. So everywhere I mentioned exponents in PEMDAS, 
we got to remove. then. Okay. So our algebraic expression, 6b, we know what that means. That means 6 multiplied by b, 6 times b. Yeah, yeah I'm not the only one who uses the childish uh, nomenclature of times. To make it into C++, you use the asterisk. For x, y, you just have to put asterisks between everything. 3, 12, you need to put an asterisk between those two. All right, guys, let's do a little bit of coding. You've probably already, in another class, may have done a guessing game where you have to, the computer tells you to pick a number between 1 or 10, you know, or whatever, and if you guess it wrong, it lets you keep guessing until you get it right. To get this program to work, we're going to need a random int generator for C++. So, whenever I need to remember something, so to speak, I just type in the question and it usually takes me to Stack Overflow. Oh, these are awful. We would use the random library. Okay, so we have all this stuff that I typed in. I don't know if you did or not. To get rid of it so that it's no longer part of what gets executed, rename it to main2 if you did it. If you didn't do it, that's fine. But we're going to do the rest of this now. We're going to write a random uh, a game that picks a random number lets the user guess it. So if you had a main already going, change the name of it to main2 because the program could only have one main in it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to delete a bunch of stuff. That's probably going to give me errors. Allow me to fix those errors, please. Okay. So we need the random library. So pound sign include random. We're going to generate a random number. So we're going to use that library. Forgive me for popping over here and seeing how to do it. Horrible. I don't want the most complex way possible. Randomness and random numbers. Tour of accounting. Over here we have our random number generator. Nine, 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 nine. Are you sure that's random? That's the problem with randomness. You can never be sure. Okay. So what's the difference between a pseudo-random number and a real random number? A pseudo-random number is one that's generated by an algorithm, meaning that it will repeat the same sequence every time. And that's the kind of random numbers that we get from writing computer programs. If you're going to generate a real random number, it's got to be based on something weird, like the number of clicks of a Geiger counter or something like that, because a computer just flat out cannot calculate a true random number. You can simulate a true random number by, quote, seeding your algorithm with a value that can't be predicted, like the clock count, how many seconds have been, you know, executed since midnight. So there's a function in the C standard library called RAND, R-A-N-D. If we use this function, we will be able to get rid of that uh, include random function. 
And this is how I remember doing it in school. I was hoping to do something fancier, but then it was looking pretty ugly. It gets you a random number between 0 and 256 squared, which is 32767. Yeah, and then what we're going to use is we're going to use modulus to bring it down to a better size. Yeah, we're going to get rid of that. Instead, we're going to bring in CSTD Live. So open your code back up, take out that include random, instead make it say CSTD Live. Okay, so we're going to call that number our our secret. int secret is equal to R E N D. But now we want to bring it down so that it's between 1 and 100. So secret is equal to secret modulus 100. Why? Because that'll chop it off so that it's a number between 0 and 99. And you see why? It's just like dividing something into dollars and cents. If you modulus something by 100, you get the last two digits of it. And that'll be random enough for our sake. But then we're going to add 1 to it, because this would get us a number between 0 and 99. And we want it to be one, between 1 and 100. I'm going to add a comment to that effect. Random number between 1 and 100. Let's see if it's the same number every time. Let's just see out our secret number followed by ENDL, and run it a few times and see if we get the same number every time. If we do, that means that we need to seed it with a random value, a pseudo-random value, like the number of seconds. There were build errors. I am not surprised. What are my build errors? It's all that code. All right, I'm going to comment all this stuff out. Here's how to comment a whole bunch of stuff at once. You can highlight everything and then go to Edit, Advanced, Comment Section. Or I could have just used that slash star and then star slash. There. Everything I've typed in previously is now commented out. It will no longer cause me any problems. I should have just started a new file. Okay, so I ran it. It said 42. I run it again. It says 42. I run it again. It says 42. Obviously, it's not a pseudo-random number. Or, you know, we can guess it. That would be okay for our code at first. Mine did 42 as well. Yeah. So whatever algorithm is, following is being seeded with the same starting point. And what do I mean by that is that a random number function takes one value and it runs it through an algorithm to give you a second value. And then that second value is used, it's fed back into the algorithm to give you a third value and a fourth value and so on. So that's what... It's happening here, but it's always starting at the same point. Its seed value is the same, so we're, and it's the same on all of our computers. It's probably just zero. We need to find a way of seeding it. Hopefully that will tell us. The numbers generated by R, A, and D are not random enough because it generates the same sequence every time the code is run. Let's print out a couple more random numbers. Uh, just take that line, these two lines here, Secret is equal to secret percent 100 plus 1, and then that C out, and then just paste them a few times. Just so we see a series of random numbers. That's a crude way of doing that, but it'll work. 42, 43, 44. What the? Oh. Excuse me. Undo what I just did. Do it this way instead. Make the first line say int secret is equal to zero or something like that. And then the next line say secret is equal to rand. And then copy those three lines over and over and over. I forgot a semicolon. Forty-two, sixty-eight, thirty-five. That's looking better. If we were going to 
you know, play one of those games like D&D or whatever, Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, where you roll three dice and you add them together to get, you know, the strength of your character or whatever. We wouldn't want a random number between 1 and 100. We would want a random number between 1 and 6. No, it just increases every time. Yeah, depending on if you're rolling D20. Yeah. So yours is going to from 32 to, or 42 to 43 to 44, is that what you're seeing? Yeah, it just says 42, 3, 2, Okay, I had to make a change to my code to get that to work. Um, do this. Add this line, secret is equal to rand, in front of everything, the other two things that we pasted. Uh, in front of each word? Yeah. That was my mistake, and I apologize for not typing it incorrectly the first time. Oh, well, see, you're just printing the number out three times. You're not calculating new ones. you got to calculate it again. So oh, you want those three okay. lines. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. So the numbers generated are not really random. It generates the same sequence every time. To make a different sequence of numbers, you specify a seed as an argument to a function called srand. Our other function was called rand. srand seeds our number. So go back here, and we're just going to, right before our first call to rand, do this. srand, and just pick a number. And run it. If you type 0, well, you get some errors because I made a horrible mistake somewhere. Probably down at the bottom in my examples. Yeah. Thirty nine, twenty, thirty nine. If I run it again, I'm going to get the same numbers because it's starting with a value of zero each time. That's being fed into the algorithm. If I change that to a one, then it'll generate a sec a different. 42, 68, 35. Is that what our numbers were before we added SRAND? That 42 is looking real familiar. If I comment out SRAND, I think I will see the same sequence of numbers. 42, 68, 35. So that's our answer. This random number generator is seeded with the value of 1. And whatever value you seed it with dictates the subsequent series of numbers that are going to be generated. Now that's all well and good, but it's still the same one every time for any specific seed. I just ran it. It says 4617. If I run it again without changing that 2 to something else, it's going to give me 4617. So what you want to do is you want to pick a number as your seed that can't really be guessed. And the easiest way to do that is based on time, the number of seconds since midnight, because it's very unlikely that the programmer will manage to run it exactly you know, at the same second after midnight every single time they play the game. Does that make sense what a random, what a pseudo random number is? I don't know the formula for it, but it's one is fed into it and it gives us something else like 36. And then 36 is fed into it and it gives us something else, 72. So each time it runs, if the seed was one, it's going to generate the same sequence. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Okay. So SRAND seeds it. But we want a better seed than just a hard-coded number because it'll still generate. So we're going to call a function called time, which is part of the time library. We're going to add yet another include to it. What's so significant about I know I asked you this in Python, but the whole, I know there's sometimes when I'm doing things like on my Android, like in the shell and stuff like that, you get something that talks about December 31st, 1969. And it's, I know you explained it to Well, me. there are some magic times, magic values, where, you know, if you pick zero as your time value, and then it gets converted into hours and minutes or days, you know, years, months, day, hours, minutes, and seconds, what does zero mean? Does it mean, you know, the date... When Christ is born, you know, <laughs> or does it, you know, and some uh, systems use, you know, January 1, 1901, and other systems use other arbitrary dates as the first second. So 
what's happening is whatever system you're using it on, they've decided that that's the first second. Could that possibly be when the system was invented? Or? Well, it's 1969 might be the invention of Unix. I don't yeah, know. That was that was uh, at AT&T, right? Yeah, sounds right. And so DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, used a different one for the first first day of the VAX being invented. And Macintosh used like 1901 or something like that. So, we can seed our random number generator with something better than that. Let's include, pound sign include, C time. And this is going to give us a warning when we do this, but it's okay. I think I did that wrong. I should go back and look at the page here. Oh, you have to pass in a number. I don't know what that zero means that we're passing in, but what the function returns is a number of seconds since zero on midnight, January 1, 1970. That's probably pretty close to what you're seeing. Yeah. So it seems truly random unless you manage to run multiple programs at the same second. But we're converting it into an int because it probably actually returns a long, long or something. If an int can hold up to 2 billion, are there more than 2 billion seconds between now and 1970? I don't know. I don't think so. But, uh, okay. Going back to our code. srand it with the value of time 0. Like that. So this function generates a value that cannot be predicted because it's the number of seconds since computers, the Unix operating language was invented January 1st. It's just an arbitrary time. So other system calls you can use will give you the number of seconds since midnight, and that's, another, that's a commonly used random value. Okay, now we finally got it so that each time we run it, we should get a sequence of different numbers. 91, 99, 91. Run it again. 11, 53, 72. This is looking much better. 3, 4, 5, 6, 4, 9. Far better. Okay, what time is it? It's 9, 13. We really don't have time to do the whole shebang. That's far more complicated complicated than Python. Python. Yeah. yeah. All, <laughs> right. There is a function similar to randint um, for C++, and I was hoping it would pop up in that first link that I was looking at. And instead, it was looking gnarly. So I went back to this is that like the C way of doing it. People were generating random numbers like this back in the early 70s. Do, am I going to ask you to memorize this syntax? No. Am I going to ask you to write games based on random numbers? I very well might. So it's worth copying to our notes. One thing you could do is you could put this into a function so that it was easier to call. We haven't really talked about functions other than saying that main is a function. Here's what a function could look like. Int get rnd 100, or rnd 6. This is like just rolling a six-sided die a cube. And so int r for r value is equal to rand modulus 100 plus 1 return r except it's not 100 we just want a 6 cider there we go now let's roll three dice int d1 comma d2 comma d3 d1 is equal to get rnd6 d2 is equal to get rnd6 d3 is equal to get rnd6 why did we do that? Why did we encapsulate in code? Because this looks a lot better than doing all that modulusing every single time. So a function is a chunk of code that has a name like that. This chunk of code can be invoked by using that name. We have a function called get rnd6. Every time this word appears with these parentheses after it, it calls this function. 
the function executes those two lines of code, and then this value, whatever it calculated as its random value, gets returned with that return statement so that it can be copied into that. So now we could print out D1 plus D2 plus D3. C out D1, D2, D3, and DL. 665. I hope it doesn't do the same thing every time. I did that before it was seeded, so it is going to do the same thing every single time. I made a mistake here. 665. I should have put those calls to the random number generator after the code seeds the random number generator. Right there. 346 that time. Hopefully it's something different this time. 445. You know, we could play Yahtzee if we were rolling five numbers. All right. Theoretically, we're supposed to keep going. I guess we have enough time to actually do the guessing game. So, let's modify our code or comment out everything that we don't need. I'm just going to cut it and move it elsewhere. Down at the bottom, I'm going to do an open multi-line comment like that, paste it, have the close one. You can just delete it if you want. I'm going to get rid of that one for the same reason. Okay, I don't need that line for Pete's sake. Okay. Sorry, guys. That's where I want us to be. I deleted one too many things. Secret is equal to R and D times or modulus 100 plus 1. That's going to be our secret number. Now we want a loop. We haven't talked about loops. I think we've seen if statements, right? A loop is very similar to an if statement. But instead of saying if the guess is correct, we're going to do while the guess is correct. We need a number to represent the guess. So I'm going to do int guess, and I'm going to set it arbitrarily to an invalid number because I don't want it to actually work. You know, if our random number is between 1 and 100, I don't want to initialize this guess value with 1 because 1% 1 of the time that would actually be the answer. Okay, so while guess is not equal to our secret number, we're going to keep looping. So let's tell them to enter a number between 1 and 100. Right, right. We had to define it so that we could loop on it. Okay, so C out, enter a number between 1 and 100, C, I, and guess. Let's make sure this much code works before we keep going, because with all the changes I was making earlier, I don't want syntax errors. I'm just going to have to quit it, because nothing ever causes the program to, to leave. Well, that's not true. If I actually got the guess right, it would stop working. It's not giving us a dang clue. It's not telling us whether the number's too small or whatever. It's obviously not a good guessing game. But it did compile and run. I would like for y'all's code to do that. If you're getting weird syntax errors, stop me. Let me know. Okay, so what are the three possibilities? Guess might equal secret. Guess might be less than. Guess might be greater than. So if guess is equal to secret, let's print out a yay message. Yay. Correct. Slash n. Or endl. <laughs> let's tack on a second one. If guess is less than secret, we're going to print out too low. C out. Nope. Too low. And I put my arrows going the wrong way. One last if. If the guess is greater than the secret, into parentheses, C out, too high. Try again, too high.
enter a number between 1 and 100, 50, try again, too high, I eventually guessed it. You couldn't see what I was typing, but I eventually guessed it. Okay, so if I want to add a counter to it, there's always more than one way to do it, but I'm going to declare my counter and initialize it above the while loop. So underneath that line, int guess is equal to zero, or I could even put it right here, comma, you know, um, but I'm going to put on its own line. I'm going to call it counter is equal to zero. And then at the top of the loop, every time they make a guess, or even before, I'm just going to put counter plus plus there. Or I could do, because we haven't talked about that, counter is equal to counter plus one. Those two things mean the same thing. If you're a Python programmer, you've also seen this, counter plus equals one. This language supports that as well, or you can just do plus plus. They both mean the same thing. Oh, so you don't have to do, I thought you would have to do counter equals counter plus plus, that's what I do, but I mean it does the same thing. Yeah, okay. Now, why don't we print out the guess? Guess number followed by the counter followed by E and DL. And you may have solved it a different way if you've already solved it. So in our guess between 1 and 150, nope, too low, 75, guess again, too high, 60, too high, 55, what, 54, 53, 52, okay. <laughs> so you can figure out the maximum number of guesses it would take. I'll be right there. That's called a binary search where you keep cutting in half, you know. If it's between 1 and 100, you guess 50. If 50 is too high, you cut it in half again, 25. And then, you know, you take that range and you cut it in half. So you either go to 12 or 37, you know, whatever. The maximum number of guesses it would take to do that kind of thing is expressed as the formula log 2 of the number of guesses of the range, like that. So log 2 100 gives us, it takes at most, if you play the game perfectly, seven guesses in order to get it right. If the range was 1,000, then it would take a maximum of 10 guesses, which really isn't that many more, you know? It took 7 to get a number between 1 and 100, and it takes 10 to get a number between 1 and 1,000. Why is that? Well, it's because you're cutting it down each time. 1,000, 500, 250, by the time you're there, you know, you've, you've already gotten the range down to almost 100 just with three guesses. So, not that you have to memorize that. Yeah. Okay. 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 What? So, what if we didn't want to print the guess number there, or what if we wanted to print it out when we say, yay, correct, it took a certain number of guesses? You may have tried to put it here, above or below that C out line. C out, but I'm going to have to make a change to get this to work. C out, it took counter guesses. That looks right but you're going to have to add some curly braces. Put a curly brace there and a curly brace there. 
because if you're going to leave the curly brace out, it only accepts one line underneath it. If you want to do more than one line as being subordinate to the if statement, you've got to use the braces. It's not a bad habit to use the braces even if you're using one line. The only reason I do, I was skipping that, is because skipping the braces let me put more code on the screen at the same time, which is not a real great excuse for doing it. Why is it a good idea to put braces even if there's only one line? It's so that if you go back and you modify it like you just did, you don't have to remember to add the braces. They're already there. Okay. Yeah, I'm still having this, this problem. Okay. So, maybe I'm not. so when I enter the number two one, I do something that I wish for him. It, it's doing it twice. Okay, let's take a look. So you're going to need braces. This if and this if as well. Same oh, situation. Okay. All right. Yep. We finished that within 15 minutes. We actually had enough time to finish it. Yeah, yeah. It went more quickly than I thought. I'm not sure why it takes like most of a class period to do it in fundamentals. And once we were done explaining the random feature, which took 20 minutes, then that one went real fast. All right, so that's enough of that. We're going to stop here, but I do want to talk about the homework assignment. Let me go grab it. I should resume this. Okay, so here's our first option. Write a character generator for D&D, &D, Dungeons & Dragons, or Pathfinder. I believe they have the same six traits. Generate six values representing traits for a character, which are strength, intelligence, con, wisdom, dexterity, and charisma. Each trait is a sum of three random numbers, one to six, just like rolling three dice and adding them up. So each trait will be a number between three and 18. Then print, make your program print it out. You know, in the format, str colon, 12, intelligence, 7, con, colon, 18, whatever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how exactly, I'm still kind of confused on how you would make, like, just make that number, the whole modulus thing is still not clicking in my head, to make that number between 3 and 18. Well, you're not going to make it between 3 and 18, you're going to make it between one and six, but generate three of them and add them. Oh, okay. Right. right. So each trait is a sum of three random numbers between one and six. Okay. So, so the formula for that is. That was the thing that we did with the. Yeah, we did that with the random number function. Um, I'll just go and copy it. That, that one, that guy. You can use this one. Here is a sample function. <laughs> like that. And in our notes, we'll have the entire program for generating a random number, you know. Or you just go and look in this program that you wrote. Now let me grab the other one. I keep saying that. I keep not doing it. Let's, uh, box. And this program is going to be familiar to the folks who did 1013 because the concept is the same. We're just writing it in a different language. If you want to do both of them, you get extra credit. Is there no? In the wrong section. Well, oh. it was supposed to be there. <laughs> so somehow, people did that assignment without any instructions. I'm real impressed with them. More likely, the D2L lost my attachment. Is it in the old notes thing? Did you I'll look. Yeah, if I don't find it here, I'll look. 
Yeah, because I don't have it this semester before. All right, I'll just generate it again on the fly. Or a BMI calculator. BMI stands for body mass index. And people use it as a shorthand for whether you're overweight or whatever. It's not really good for that because somebody who's muscular will show up as having a higher BMI. And, you know, it's not a problem to be muscular. But, you know, a linebacker or whatever might show up on this scale as having a BMI of over 30, which is considered, you know, overweight or whatever. But who cares about that? What matters is the way that it is calculated. The formula for calculating body mass index, you need to ask them for their height in inches and their weight in pounds. BMI, English units formula. And so it is, the formula is the weight in pounds divided by the height squared times 703. And the times 703 could happen, you know, before everything. So body mass index, what your program needs to do is ask for the height in inches. And when I say ask, I mean prompt and use CIN. Ask for the weight in pounds and then calculate BMI according to this equation. BMI is equal to 703 times inches divided by pounds squared. Okay, so this one would take you two to five to ten minutes to do, really. You can probably tell it's real similar to stuff we've already written. I'll format this uh, this assignment better. Do pick one or do both for extra credit. Okay. Other than the fact that some of y'all haven't played D and D and, and are completely confused by that, does this make sense? Yes. Are we good? The second assignment is by, or the second half of it is by far probably the faster. Ask for the height in inches. You just use C out to print what is your height in inches. And then you use CIN to read into a variable called inches. Ask for the weight in pounds. C out. What is your weight in pounds? CIN into something called pounds. Then calculate BMI according to this equation. I gave you the equation right there. I would use double the whole way through. Make all your variables doubles. And then print the results and the BMI when the calculation is done. Yeah, let, let, let's upload both of those into the same folder. Go ahead and put your guessing game, CPP, in the same folder as the operator's quiz.